The United States men's national team defeated Panama in Mauricio Pochettino's debut. It wasn't perfect, but we are off to a good start for multiple reasons, not just the win. Now, the United States must travel to Mexico and face, well, Mexico in what is the biggest rivalry in North America and likely the biggest mid-off in world soccer. And you know what? Even though the US and Mexico is a ginormous mid-off, it's always exciting. It's always fun. And I'm very much looking forward to this game. For that reason, let's talk about it. Hi, if you're new here, I'm Filippo and welcome to Tactical Manager TV and welcome to the United States versus Mexico match preview. Now, before I tell you how it's going to go, just a quick thing. We dealt with a hurricane here in Florida. That's why I don't have my regular studio. Hopefully we're back there this week. Very soon. There's power outages all over Tampa. I want to go back to Tampa, but to deliver these videos to you, unfortunately, I cannot be in Tampa. With that said, this is how this episode's gonna go. First, we're gonna go through when and where to watch the game, along with the record between both teams and much more. Then we're gonna go through the current news and updates on the US men's national team, along with the projected starting 11. Last but not least, we're gonna bring in Jack from Deadball TV to represent Mexico for their portion of this video. So as always, sit back, relax, hit the like button, because I told you to do so, and you always listen to tactical manager who doesn't listen to tactical manager and let me know in the comment section down below you know i fully expect the u.s men's national team to defeat mexico because we simply have a much better team these days and we also have a better coach which would actually be a massive win especially because we're going to be playing against mexico away but to my question what is your expectation and definition of success for this game and obviously let me know if you're a u.s men's national team fan or an l3 fan in the comment section Okay, let's play the intro and start the episode. The United States men's national team is set to face Mexico in Guadalajara this Tuesday at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Yes, you heard that right. 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Most of the U.S. population lives on the East Coast, so it's gonna be a rough one. I'm gonna need some late night coffee or probably something stronger. Don't do drugs, kids. And if you're in the United States of America, you may watch this game on TNT or Max. You can also tune in here on YouTube. We're gonna be doing a live watch along. You can mute the game when you're watching it on TNT or Max and come hang out with me. Yeah, join us during the game. I don't bite unless you want me to bite. Throughout history, the United States and Mexico have faced each other 77 times with a quite large advantage for Mexico. The US men's national team won 24 games while Mexico has won 36 and then they tied 17 times. But in recent history, which is what truly matters anyway, the US men's national team has a clear advantage. No, seriously, it's not debatable. Obviously, this game on Tuesday can go either way. But it's quite clear that the U.S. has the better players these days. We have the better team and we also have the better coach. It's not debatable. So let's exclude the 2023 El Cachico between MLS players and Liga Mekis players that ended in a 1-1 draw. From 2020 beyond in the post-COVID era, both teams have faced each other six times with five American wins and one draw. During this time, the U.S. men's national team scored 11 goals and Mexico scored just two, which was back in the 2021 Nations League final. Three of those games were Nations League knockout games, semifinals or finals. Two of them were World Cup qualifying and one was a Gold Cup final. Five of those games were under Greg Berhalter and one of them was under interim head coach or interim coach B.J. Callahan. Now, one thing that's important to point out is that out of those six games, five of them were played in the United States. One was played in Mexico. The one that was played in Mexico ended in a 0-0 draw. To be fair, the US was much better and probably should have won that game, but the only game that the US didn't defeat Mexico from 2020 beyond was the one we played in the Azteca in Mexico City. And now we're gonna have to face Mexico in Guadalajara. Now, back in 2012, the US men's national team played Mexico away. It was actually the last time that we had a friendly against Mexico in Mexico. And for that specific game, the US men's national team ended with a 1-0 win thanks to Breck Shea. And I know, I know, Breck Shea didn't score for the US men's national team that game, but we have an agenda to push here at Tactical Manager TV, so do not question me. Just go with it. Breck Shea is quite literally 
the reason why we beat Mexico in 2012. To be fair, he, he did play a big role. Jokes aside. So what's my point here in this section? The United States has dominated Mexico in the United States. It's been five games in a row with Mexico being held scoreless against the US. Complete dominance from the US men's national team. Now, it's time to be challenged in Mexico. But we're gonna dive into that later in the video with Jack. And no, it's not Jack from the Titanic. That Jack died. Now let's talk about the U.S. men's national team. Okay, so against Panama, I did an injured 11, which was essentially a starting 11 of U.S. men's national team players that are injured, unavailable. Unfortunately, that injured 11 roster has gotten much deeper. There were players that were added. I'm not going to do another injured 11, but I want to go through a list because it matters. The context matters. This is not an excuse. I still think the U.S. men's national team has a much better team than Mexico and should still win, even though we're going to be playing away. But the context of the players that are missing matters. And I want to go, go through this list very quickly. And they are Tyler Adams. He's not going to be available, of course. Gio Reyna, Tim Weah, Sergio Des, Johnny Cardoso, Chris Richards, Cameron Carter-Vickers, and Balogun. On top of that, the following five players that were in camp headed back to their clubs due to minor injuries or load management. And they are Marlon Fossey, Weston McKinney, Christian Pulisic. Yes, Christian Pulisic, the one player that Mexico calls daddy will not be there. And then we will also not have Zach Steffen. That might not matter too much. And Ricardo Pepe won't be there, unfortunately, after scoring a goal against Panama. We're essentially going with a B team. But still, as I said before, no excuses. Get the win. Now, with all those players missing, what will Pochettino's starting 11 look like? And I believe he's going to go with a 4-2-3-1 formation. Again, different phases of play. The formation can change. But for the sake of this section of the video, let's go with the 4-2-3-1. We're going to talk about the shape and possession very soon. I want to address that. But for the 4-2-3-1, Matt Turner will likely be the goalie. He was horrible with his feet against Panama. But again, he was a great shot stopper against him. I believe he's going to start once again. The right back will be Joe Scali. I mean, Marlon Fossey's not available. Who else would you put, put there? Maybe Eunice Musa, but very unlikely. We're we're going to go Joe Scali on the right, A-Rob on the left. The two center backs are probably going to be Mark McKenzie and Tim Ream. Maybe Pochettino will test out Trusty, a left-footed center back, to replace Ream. But I doubt it. For this game, I believe he's going to go with Tim Ream and Mark McKenzie. Maybe even Miles Robinson gets a shot. But I think he's going to play it safe and go with McKenzie and Ream. The double pivot midfield will likely be Aiden Morris and Gianluca Busio, which, quite honestly, they earned it. They were good against Panama. The central attacking midfielder against Panama was Aronson. But for this game, I think he's going to rotate and play Malik Tillman. On the right wing, I believe he will start Yunus Musa once again. Yunus Musa did score his first U.S. men's national team goal against Panama, and he played as a right winger that game, and I think that is where he's going to play once again. Now, the left wing, we don't have Christian Pulisic, so he's probably going to go with Brendan Aronson or Haji Wright. I'm going to assume he's going to give Haji Wright a shot. Haji came off the bench against Panama, got an assist, played well. Haji should get a shot. And then up top, probably going to be Josh Sargent getting another shot here. Brendan Vasquez will be the backup because again, Ricardo Pepe is not available. And you know what? This might be obviously not the last opportunity. I can't be so doom and gloom, but Sargent has to perform. He hasn't performed well for the national team in quite some time. And it doesn't matter what you do for Norwich if you always come to the national team and drop stinkers. So Sargent has to perform. Now, understand that we don't have that much data on Pochettino, so I could get a, a few players here and there wrong with the starting 11. With Burhalter, we had a lot of data on him, so it was very easy to predict the starting 11. I got most of it right most of the time. With Pochettino, we don't have that much data, so the odds of myself getting it wrong is pretty high, even though I'm usually right except for the times I'm wrong. Now, before we move on, I want to talk about how, you know, Pochettino set up this team last game in possession against Panama. It was a 3-2-4-1 shape, which is quite interesting, a back three. So the right back, Joe Scali, would become a center back in possession. Musa and Anthony Robinson, so Musa on the right wing and Robinson as the left back, would provide the width in possession. They would stay out wide. The double pivot would stay central. In this case, it was Busio and, and Aiden Morris, which helped with ball progression through central positions. Now, the interesting part of this too is Pulisic was tucked inside almost in the half space, not almost in the half spaces, playing as a 10 essentially with Brendan Aronson next to him rather than being a winger. He was like an inside forward. And with this shape in possession, there were actually some quick noticeable improvements from the U.S. men's national team under Pochettino versus the previous one with Burhalter and even B.J. Callahan and all other coaches. For starters, ball progression through central positions were much better. We were awful the past five years and the back three with the double pivot staying central in possession did the trick in helping progress the ball forward 
through the middle and not just through the sides, through the flanks. How he utilized Pulisic tucked inside was actually quite good also, and it will pay dividends once Pulisic plays with a very good 10, like Malik Tillman or Gio Reyna, where he can combine Unlike Aronson, that's more of a pressing tent. Now, the build-out with the back three, rarely using Matt Turner and not involving A-Rob, was much better. On top of all of that, I personally thought that the team looked far more fluid in possession. That's just my personal opinion. The only aspect that I think still has, well, there's a lot to work on, but one aspect that I didn't like, and I hope it improves quite a bit in the next few games, is how we play in transition on the counterattack when we are counterattacking the opponent. There's a lot of room for improvement there, and it hasn't improved yet. It will improve under Pochettino. Most of his club teams were really good in transition, so I expect the United States to improve in transition fairly quickly with under Pochettino. Now let's move on from the US and talk about Mexico. We're gonna have Jack, not from the Titanic, right? That one died, I already said that before. Jack from Deadball TV. He's gonna be our guest representing Mexico, and keep in mind that we recorded this with Jack before Christian Pulisic and Weston McKennie were cut from the U.S. men's national team and headed back home. It doesn't really change our overall opinion about how this game is going to go, but obviously not having Pulisic doesn't help the U.S. at all. After all, he is the best player in CONCACAF. Don't forget to drop a like because I won't be asking when Jack is here. And with that said, let's bring in our guest to talk about Mexico. Okay, Jack, welcome back to the channel representing Mexico once again. You guys have seen better days in the past. It hasn't been great. You guys just played Valencia. We're going to talk about that. Valencia is kind of like reserves, a relegation team in La Liga. And Mexico tied them 2-2. We'll talk about that in a second. But before anything else, how are you doing there in Argentina? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. If it was not for the Café con Leche and Media Lunas combo that I could get for $2.50, I'd be furious right now. $2.50, that's a lot in Argentina. I thought it would be less. I'm in a bougie part of town. Okay. Okay. Luxurious part. Uh, so <laughs> exactly, we're, we're here to, we're not here to talk about Argentine coffee. Um, we're here to talk about, Unfortunately. yeah, we're going to talk about Mexico and the United States. We play this Tuesday at 10 30 PM Eastern time. So super late for everyone on the East coast, kind of late for everyone central time and not so late for anyone that is in California or the West coast. Mexico has been struggling with the United States quite a bit in the post COVID era. We played like six times, not counting that cash grab one between MLS and Liga Mekis and Mexico lost five to the U S and tied one that was at home. All the ones in the U S the United States has won. I believe Mexico hasn't scored against the U S since that nation's league final, right? The, the one in 2021 and you guys had Tata Martino. Then you guys got like Diego Coca. Then um, it was like, Jimmy Lozano, right? The last one. And then now the coach mm -hmm. is like, yeah, he's back. And I wanted first to get your thoughts on this. Like, do you believe, like, based on what you saw of Mexico against Valencia and what you saw the U.S. against Panama, do you think this is one, one of those games where the U.S. will actually get a win against Mexico away, which at least under Burhalter, it was really unexpected and under an older Mexico with much more talent. But you guys haven't been good. The short answer is yes. Um, I told you off camera that I, I was recording my thoughts about the Valencia game and I do think given what we've seen from this rivalry in recent years and also what we've seen from Mexico under Aguirre and obviously we only have one game under Pochettino but we could be looking at a historic you know first ever defeat to the United States in Guadalajara like obviously the U.S. has one win all time at the Azteca this could definitely be number two and it pains me to say that but there's really very few things I can point to that would indicate, oh, Mexico, they're going to get a, a victory here. And I think if we pull something out, again, I don't want to be disparaging, but I think it would be something fortunate happening. Like, I do think it would be a penalty kick or, you know, an Edson Alvarez header or something late in the game. I do not think it would be going pound for pound against the U.S., you know, in the midfield and just creating chances because – we haven't seen, quite frankly, I, I'm curious if you would disagree with this, the last three meetings that I can remember against the U.S., it's not even that Mexico has lost, it's that Mexico has been dominated, and when we have the ball, we are creating maximum two chances per game, half chances per game. We don't really create any clear-cut opportunities. I mean, I, Matt Turner gets to take the games off half the time. So I think it's, you know, early indicators are pointing towards a a historic defeat for Mexico in this game. 
so let me ask you one thing. Uh, the United States against Panama, it wasn't perfect, but we already saw some signs of improvement in regards to Burhalter to Pochettino. Very small ones, but ball progression in central areas of the field. That's something Pochettino changed right away with a three, uh, back three in possession, double pivot, trying to connect the tens, Pulisic playing tucked inside. A few things that we saw improve. He also noticed like playing out of the back would be tricky with Turner, so he's trying to overload more like towards the center backs, the width would come from Yunus Musa and A-Rob. A-Rob was very high up the field rather than helping on the build-out, which is not his strength. He's a really good player in certain, like in very in a very specific role, and Pochettino saw that right away. So we already saw some improvements. Um, there were also some negatives. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, Mexico, under Aguirre, he's back. Uh, do you think there's been any improvements? Is there anything he can do? Because I'm, I'm starting to think Mexico, so the U.S., there's still debate. Are the players the problem? Is it the coach? Are the players overrated? And honestly, they might be, depending on like who you ask, or they are they underrated? Can they achieve more? Mexico has had other coaches, and it's starting to feel like it doesn't matter who they get. It's going to be a struggle with these players. Have there been any improvements with Aguirre already? That is tough to say because the strong suit of Mexico, which is this, this is hilarious, by the way, after allowing a 2-2 remontada from Valencia's B team, but what we have been good at, especially under Lozano, was defensively. Like, let's not forget, we allowed one goal at the Copa America, and it was a penalty. So it's difficult for me to say that Aguirre has made us better. You know, we beat New Zealand 3 nothing. Who cares? Although, I guess for the U.S., maybe that's an impressive result. You didn't do that. We drew Canada. You didn't, you didn't do that, and I don't think we should look too much into that, but... Um, that's, that was a good moment for Maguire, but again, defensively, is it really, uh, impressive keeping a clean sheet against the Kiwis? Or I think they're called the all whites. No, it's not. We kept a clean sheet against Canada. That was a much tougher game. Neither side could really do much. Canada probably had the best chance of the game. I think it was Malagon had a great save. We kept a clean sheet. Now we failed to keep a clean sheet against a team with, uh, that is comprised of, with all due respect, nobody's in La Liga and Academy kids who me watching La Liga every single weekend, I didn't know who eight of those guys were that we were playing against. So you can't say defensively we've gotten better. Attacking wise, I mean, we've had five goals in three games against one solid opposition in Canada, and we were unable to score. And again, similar to what I said earlier in this video, we had one phenomenal chance. Gino Huerta sent Santi Jimenez through one on one, and he couldn't score. So it was kind of the same game that I've seen with the U.S., where we get one good chance per game, and if it's not converted, the U.S. wins. That's kind of how it went against Canada. It was a nil-nil draw. So what has gotten better? I don't really think anything, um, <laughs> because the defense doesn't really have anywhere to go. We can't really go up. And the offense, score a goal against the U.S. Get a goal against the U.S., and I'll say, yeah, we've gotten better offensively. But outside of that, man, I I really can't but, say But much. I, I, you're probably saying don't get like a fluke goal. You want to see them create volume because because Mexico might not even score against the U.S. But if you see plenty of goal scoring opportunities, you can go, hey, they got unlucky with this and that. What you're saying is it seems like Mexico just doesn't create enough. We have. Oh, God, I'm going to keep the try to keep this short. We have profiles of players available to us in the pool that could be a creative outlet in a central position. Now, we don't play those players, and oftentimes they're not even called up. So what ends up happening is we rely on what I expect to see in the, in the U.S. game is Oberlin Pineda to play as the 10. Oberlin Pineda cannot create chances against any national team better than Guatemala. The U.S. is better than Guatemala. So for that reason, I do not think we're going to see I'm glad you gave us credit from the for being better than Guatemala. I'm glad you gave You guys that. are better than Guatemala. And I... I I think I put enough respect on Guatemala on Deadball TV, but they are not as good as the U.S. men's national team. Spoiler alert. Sorry for the Guatemaltecos watching this. Hot take. Hot take. Um, hot take. Guatemala's worse than the U.S. So, I think they just won their Nations League game decisively, but that's not what this video is about. Um, I would be okay if we created four really good chances and Matt Turner has a monster game and just, you know, keeps a clean sheet for the U S and it ends in a draw. Personally, I wouldn't care. I'd be like big dub. We actually did something. Yeah. It's a, it's going to be fascinating because under Burhalter, the U S also struggled a lot to create anything that wasn't from like crosses, right? Like cross, 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 trying to find something. I wouldn't say we were perfect against Panama in terms of 
creating. I think I thought we should have created more, but I do also think playing Brendan Aronson at the 10 doesn't help for creativity, mm -hmm. right? You probably would do a lot better with Giovanni Reina or maybe Malik Tillman or God, even Pulisic playing, even though Pulisic was tucked inside quite a bit, he wasn't really the 10, it was more Brendan. So let me ask mm -hmm. you this. I'm going to put this on screen right now. This is the starting 11 that Mexico put out to face um, Valencia. I don't know if you know or anyone knows what Aguirre will do against the U.S. I guess there's going to be a lot of rotation. I heard Guardado was going to start against the U.S. Uh, that was one thing I saw like floating around on Twitter. Memo Cho is in the roster as far as I know. I know Raul, sorry, not Raul Jimenez. Um, Santi Jimenez is not available. He's injured. Mm -hmm. This lineup here... Um, I'm sorry, it's abysmal, but I'm assuming the U the one to face the U.S. will be a bit different. There's a few names. Like, was Raul Jimenez not available? Is he not going to start? He's been fairly decent in the Premier League now. He's probably the best center forward Mexico has right now. What is the lineup we're su supposed to expect for this game? Yeah, so this lineup, you're correct, is abysmal. It's an embarrassment. I do expect a much stronger team against the U.S. Like, for example, you're looking at Oziel Herrera, Bertrame, and Memo Martinez as the front three for Mexico here. It will be Raul Jimenez. I do expect Chino Huerta to start, and I do think Piojo will be the other winger. So I think we're going to bring, you know, our better players. But that's just what I would do. You know, we've seen howlers at a historic clip from Mexican managers. We might play the same damn team. Like, I, I do not know. Um... Johan Vasquez will slot in to the center back position alongside Cesar Montes. Will Jorge Sanchez start at right back? That's kind of the main. That and goalkeeper. I'm very curious what we do there. Do we start Memo Ochoa against the U.S.? I'm going to bet we do. Like 90% certainty, I think we start Memo Ochoa. I think one of the biggest omissions from Mexico squad, I don't know if we're going to talk about that in more detail, is Alex Padilla, who's playing for Bilbao and playing very well for Bilbao in La Liga. And he's not available for this window to be, uh, to be, he was called up last time, but didn't play. Um, wait, and then wait, if Jorge why, Sanchez, why was he, was he called in and he is injured or just wasn't called in this time? I'm not sure. Luis Chavez was also not called up, but I couldn't see any injury record for either player. So it could just be Aguirre being like, Hey, this is still my fourth, you know, third and fourth game in charge. Let's give everybody an opportunity. Okay. That might be what's going on here. Or maybe Padilla rejected it because he was called up last window and didn't play. I don't know the, the reasoning for that. But I would like to see Huescas at the right back against the United States. I think that's going to give us, for maybe the first time in five years, an attacking outlet at the right back position. Outside of just like Jorge Sanchez, who is a, he's a track athlete. He's a 100-meter dash sprinter. He's not a footballer. Is he a Mexican version of Conor Gallagher? No, the Mexican. Who's the Mexican Conor Gallagher? The, I don't know. Ours is, ours is Brendan Aronson. Ours is Brendan Aronson. Yeah, yeah. At least Brendan's a little more offensively inclined than Gallagher, who's just like a sprint. Yeah, I mean, it probably is Jorge Sanchez. Yeah, he's just he's just athletic, very low tech level. That's how I would describe him. Yeah, so with this, we're going to have to wait and see what um, Aguirre will do. We don't know. I'm assuming Mexico is going to take this game very seriously. They have to eventually bounce back against the United States. It's been a very long stretch without beating the U.S., and this one's at home, right? The other ones, there was a bit yeah. of an excuse here and there. We're playing away. They were playing the U.S. Now we're going to Guadalajara. And like you said, the last time they played a friendly, um, the U.S. and Mexico was in 2012, and the U.S. beat a friendly away, okay, a friendly away. Mexico beat the U.S. at home. Even in 2019, that was a friendly 3-0. But the last time they played a friendly away was in 2012, and the U.S. won 1-0, and there was the Azteca game. Um, mm -hmm. Now they go back to Mexico for this game, and that, that could be also Pochettino getting a bit of that Burhalter stinker away, right? That The U.S. can never win away in CONCACAF. Mexico away, probably yes. one of the toughest games in CONCACAF. So that said... If Aguirre does everything right, he gets like the lineup that you more or less want and everything. And let's say Pochettino also puts more or less the lineup we're expecting for the U.S. for this game, which would be similar to the Panama, one of the few changes here and there. What would be your score prediction as realistic as you can be for this game? As realistic as I can be, I do not see a world in where Mexico scores more than one goal. So if Mexico's going to win, it's a 1-0. We have kept a clean sheet against the U.S. in the World Cup qualifier at the Azteca, but I think Pulisic and I want to say Pefok missed one-on-ones in that game. It was actually no, no, no. A pretty Pefok good. Pefok missed the missed the wide open sitter. Okay, it and then worse. Pulisic had the one that Memo actually saved. 
Yes. And then PFOC, he missed an open sitter. Like, I think it was a cross. Okay. I think Memo came off and Gio just like passed it to him. And, and he tried a one hit and he hit it over to crossbar. The point is, like, God blessed us on that evening. And we got out of there with a nil nil draw. But again, we were we were maybe not dominated like we have been on U.S. soil, but we were beaten. We just survived out of out of fortune. So if we're going to win, it's going to be a one nothing. Can we hold the U.S. to a clean sheet? The only reason I think it's possible is because of y'all's emissions. Mm -hmm. Y'all's emissions. Josh Sargent missed that sitter against uh, Panamatsu. I'm not sure what his confidence level is like. That being said, though, Ricardo Pepe scores for fun. He could get a goal against Mexico here, um, which would be a great story. I do think the U.S. is going to win. We, we just, you know, there are times in football where there's bogey teams. And you just whatever happens, you cannot beat them. I think Mexico is Panama's bogey team. I think Panama, honestly, are the same level as Mexico right now. But we beat them every time. I think it just sometimes is how the cookie crumbles. So I'm going to say either a one nothing U.S. or a 2-1 U.S. victory in this game. 2-1. I think that's fair. I think it would be something around that. I can see also being 2-0 U.S., another Dos Acero. I think that can happen. I could see Dos Acero as well. But yes, ending on a positive note for any Mexico national team fan, just here are a few names that the U.S. Are, is currently missing. They're missing Balogun, the best center forward the U.S. has, Tim Weah, Johnny, Tyler Adams, Gio Reyna, Dest. So like these are like six players that are arguably starters or at least like, like Johnny, maybe the backup of Tyler or vice versa. They're fighting for a spot. Then outside of that, they're also missing a few guys that are like backups for the team. So the U.S. is missing roughly like 13 players in terms of like overall roster. There's a shot there, but the only problem is, and again, Pochettino is a bit unpredictable, right? We looked better against Panama, but you never know. Like we, we could test something out and go extremely wrong against Mexico. I'm going to go 2-0 to the United States. I don't like betting against the U.S. I try to be as realistic as possible. But again, it would be very odd for me to bet against the U.S., with an opponent that both of us agree on that right now there's less quality. So it doesn't make sense for me to pick yes. an upset against the U.S. Even though in the Copa America, I kind of said before the game that the Panama game was a trap game. And I was like, I'm, I'm worried about this. And then we shot the bed, obviously. Um, we had, we well, I think I think y'all just underrate Panama. I think that's a separate issue. I think people still be. don't realize Panama are actually like they're a good national team, man. Yeah, they're good. It might be. It might be. It's just um. That American arrogance, we have it. But but anyhow, it's, Mexico it's world we, renowned. Yeah, we're <laughs> definitely we definitely got humbled. Well, I mean, Mexico got humbled in the World Cup, and then the summer, the U.S. didn't get humbled in the World Cup. So then we got humbled this summer, but it was pretty bad. We became the first host nation to get grouped in the Copa America. Um, but, but we're moving on from that. It, it honestly, long term, maybe that's what the U.S. needed um, was to get punched in the face, get Burhalter out. And they're like, okay, let's get serious now and see. And now we can actually see where this, what, what level this team can perform. Now we're actually going to see. For and sure. then if, if the U.S. flops in the World Cup in 2026, well, and then the players just weren't good enough. Like we, we got what we could. In terms of coaches that the U.S. men's national team can get, I think Pochettino is probably the highest level we can get. And we're not getting Klopp. We're not getting Guardiola. We're not getting those guys. So we got the best we could. But Jack, yeah. And do you have any final thoughts? If, there, if there's one thing I want to say, because this ties into everything that has to do with the Mexico U S rivalry. You talked about the U S getting punched in the mouth at the Copa America and having a positive reaction, which I 100% agree with. And if there's one thing that I have to give the U S so much credit for that, I cannot say for Mexico is every time there's a, there's a disaster for the U S not qualifying for a world cup or getting grouped at the Copa America. There's a reaction. There's a strong reaction. And sometimes it's not the greatest, but at least there's a, a strong pivot in direction and strategy, right? Like after not qualifying in 2018, it's like, okay, we got to change the, re the recruitment strategy. We have to change the player pool. We have to change the manager. Obviously, Greg Berhalter, we can talk about his success or failures how you want, but you can't deny that he changed the course of the team. Now you're seeing the U.S. crash out of the Copa America, and they're saying, hey, we have the World Cup in 18 months. We cannot afford to fumble this. Let's go big. And you, you went bigger than I thought a CONCACAF team could get in Pochettino. With Mexico, we've been punched in the face like three times in the last calendar year, 
and we still haven't really seen the re- the response. We're still seeing the same players. We're bringing back a manager for his third stint in charge, even though he borderline failed in his previous two stints. We're bringing him back for round three, third time's a charm, I guess. So that's where I think U.S. fans are just like overall in a better environment, as toxic as it felt at times, than Mexico. Because I can say as a Mexico fan, I, I genuinely feel like I'm just stuck in in quicksand and there's no there's no escaping. That's why I can't get on this, you know, collab video with you and just say, oh yeah, Mexico three nothing against the US. I can't do that because going back to 2019, 2018, we have not seen any change. And I think that's shameful. No, and I appreciate that because very often there's a good portion of both fan bases, American and Mexican, but very often with Mexico is like the U.S. beats them. And then a few months later, Mexico completely forgets that the U.S. beat them like four times in a row. And they're like, oh, we're better than you. Like, like right now, you're not. This is easily, I mean, I'm not old, but I've watched a lot of soccer over the past 20 years. And out of the Mexican teams I've watched, I've never seen Mexico this bad. I've never seen it. Um, mm-hmm. Not even talking about coaching. I'm just talking about player quality. Um, just everything. I've never seen Mexican soccer this bad. And it doesn't seem like it's going to change in the short run, maybe 10 years from now, but like the next like two to six years, it's not looking too good. Before we go, I have a quick question for you. Cause I said this earlier in the video, in the intro, when you were not here, this is the biggest rivalry in North America, obviously in terms of like quality history right now, the, between these teams, I know you can get into like some other ones with culture, especially the Caribbean ones, but no, it's the biggest one in North America. Is this the biggest mid off in the world? It's funny you said that because it's not the biggest rivalry in terms of quality. That's the U.S. versus Canada. It's not a rivalry. That That is a rivalry. No, no. They're like after they little... dog walked you guys in the last friendly window, no, you can say it's not a rivalry. We don't see like, no, no, we don't see the maple syrup merchants. as. as Have you rival. forgotten the embarrassment in qualifying the two nothing for Canada? Have you yeah, forgotten? We don't, so we don't see them as rivals. They're they're just like uh, like America Junior, well, like. That's like fine. Wales and England. You can you cannot see them. They're gonna keep beating you. You don't have to see them, but they're gonna keep beating y'all. Yeah, that's the biggest, that's the top level rivalry in CONCACAF. It doesn't have the emotions yet, but I think it will. Like honestly, give it five years, it's gonna become, you know, the whatever you want to call it, the Northern Wall Derby. I don't I don't care, but it's Northern gonna Wall. it's gonna replace, I think. <laughs> I, I really do. Like this is becoming Mexico. Mexico US is becoming England Ireland. It's becoming a farce. It's becoming a, you know, Ireland cares. England are kind of like, bro, go away. They should like, probably should. then not hire an American coach. It's hard to take the rivalry serious when your coach is from our country. Um I think you get that point. Like, like let's say Brazil and Argentina are clashing, and then freaking Diego Simeone is in charge of Brazil. It just doesn't work that way. Um, I think if they can yeah. do that, because if there was a legit rivalry there. There would be a lot of pushback with Jesse Marsh for Canada. It's like, no, we don't want an American. They're our rivals. We don't want him. He might be good enough. The same way, for example, how would, well, I'm going to give a crap name, but there would be massive pushback in Mexico for any American coach, even Jesse Marsh. There would be pushback, even though I think Jesse Marsh might be 100%. good for Mexico, but there would be massive pushback. Um, same way with the U.S. That's of cultural. Yes. Well, even though like the U.S. would probably embrace a Mexican coach much more because, I mean, Mexican-Americans are part of our country at this point, right? It's not – we're much more Mexican than Mexicans are Americans in Mexico, right? If, if that makes any sense. 100%. But there would be pushback between the fan base. We would not want a Mexican coach. Like, there would be pushback against it because of the rivalry. That's it. Uh, so maybe the next step for it to become a rivalry is Canada walk on their own without an American coach, without Jesse Marsh. Then it can maybe spark something. But – That's all for today, everyone. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to Deadball TV. I'm going to put his handle in the description. And then if you want to follow him on Twitter, that's the handle below his head. That's not the YouTube channel, by the way. The YouTube channel is in the description. Twitter is under his head. Thank you for watching, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully, in the next video, I will be back in my regular studio. As of now, I can't until we get the power back from the hurricane damages that we had in Tampa. And hopefully, everyone's safe if you're from Florida. Now, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to drop a like before you go. Don't forget to also follow us on X. The handle is Manager Tactical. And follow us on Instagram. It's just Tactical Manager TV. It helps us quite a bit. Thank you very much for all of your support. I'll see you guys on Tuesday for the live watch along. And have a great day.